Hey, good morning, Center Church. Anybody else feeling the turkey hangover? Or is that just me? Not that I eat turkey. But if I did, uh, I feel like I've just perpetually ate this whole last week, which is good. Uh, but it's also, I feel like today I walked up, or woke up this morning, I was like, what time is it? What day are we in? What month is it? Uh, oh, yeah, it's Sunday. Like, I, I should get up, you know, just so. Uh, that's totally our house right now. I don't know how your house is. Maybe they're more spiritual uh, than that. But it's interesting because I was thinking about um, what do you what do you share like the week after sharing about a transition uh, kind of announcement of where God is leading our family and that we'll be kind of stepping away from our roles, lead pastors here um, at the end of March. So I, I got that done last Sunday and I was like, wait a second, like should I preach what's on the schedule? Should we just move forward? Like what should, what do you do with all of that? Um, and so I wasn't totally sure. I went back and forth and Ken and I talked about it last week, kind of knowing what the 19th was going to be. And I just was like, you know what, I've, I really feel like we should still talk about this because it's really been such a big part of my own journey, my own discernment of God's will in my life. And so today we're going to talk about the power of, of worshiping together, not just worship in like a broad theological sense, but like worshiping together. Like, why does it matter that what we just did happens every single week? Why does it matter that you sing? Why does it matter that you're here? Uh, and you may be like, okay, why does talking about this matter right now? Like, yeah, sure, I agree. I nod my head. Worship is important. We should worship Jesus. That's a big deal. But why right now? Like, aren't there more important things to talk about? Like, what's next for the church? What will change? What won't change? Will the next lead pastor be bald? Like, the single most important reason uh, that this church exists, I tried to think about this. Even over this last week, I just was struck by this. Like, the single most important reason this church exists and why I exist is to exalt and commune, to live in relationship with King Jesus. That is the thing. That is the, the one thing that trumps every other thing. It's more important than a leader. It's more important than a series. It's more important than a set of songs. It's more important than a small group or a good set of teachings. It's more important than giving money away. Like All of those things are good, and they fall under the umbrella of worshiping and exalting King Jesus. And when I think about that, I think about it in this, this phrase. Like, I want my life to be a life lived in response, in response to who God is, what he's done in my life. Like, I don't want to be the kind of person who sits back with arms crossed needing to be impressed more by Jesus. I want to be the kind of person who lays my life down, who sacrifices like we talked about last Sunday in response. And I get it. When we start talking about worship, especially in a setting like this, Man, there are all sorts of struggles that we bring into this. There's all sorts of obstacles that come up in your mind. They come up in my mind. Uh, Maybe you don't feel like you're a good singer, so you're like, oh, man, I can't wait till this time is over. Maybe you're an amazing singer, and you're like, I wish they would sing all the songs that I know. Like, it doesn't matter where you are. There are things that get in the way of us truly worshiping God in a setting like this. But today, Ken and I actually are going to explore this together and have a conversation kind of in front of you about this. But we want to tackle why worshiping God with our whole being as a congregation is important. Why is it important that we do that? And it's not just enough to show up and be a warm body in the room, but to actually bring Jesus our whole self, everything that we have, fully surrendered, fully open, fully available. And uh, I was thinking about this, and and about two weeks ago, or actually it was earlier this past week, earlier this past week, before feels like that was two weeks ago. But earlier this past week, uh, I was cleaning up some stuff in our basement. Now, if you've got kids or you remember the stage, if you did have kids, uh, anybody else have like a room or a section of a room in which you genuinely do not care if it's ever clean? It's just toys everywhere, Legos everywhere. Anybody, any other parents in the room have that or is that just our family? Okay, okay, a couple of you. So there's a spot in our basement. I'm like, I don't care what it looks like. It doesn't have to be clean. Like, Lennon can just go down there and rip it apart. I do not care. And so we were down there, and I said, hey, Lennon, we got to clean up some of this. It's starting to spill into areas I do care about. So we got to clean up some of these random toys and these food objects. Like, she's got pieces of a crab over here and lettuce and then uh, her pots and pans for her pretend kitchen. They're just everywhere. So I was like, let's go downstairs and let's clean them up. And so she's like, okay, Daddy. So we go downstairs, and I'm cleaning up her little mini kitchen, and she's cleaning up all the random food articles that have ended up in the the workout area that are not supposed to be there. And so she's moving them all back and forth, and I'm putting them away. 
And she kind of sits, and it's really quiet. And she looks over at me as I'm cleaning up this kitchen. And she says, Daddy, I love you. And I was like, yes, parent of the year. I made it. Like unprompted, didn't have to bribe her with anything. She just said, I love you, Daddy. And it, it was like an amazing feeling. And, and Lindsay overheard this from upstairs. She goes, okay, that's not fair. Like she hasn't said that unprompted to me yet. I have to always say it to her. I was like, I don't know. I'm just a better parent, I guess. I don't, I don't have an answer. Just she kind of looked over at me and said, I love you, Daddy. And it was an amazing moment for me because I sat there, I reflected on that story. And for me, that is the purest illustration I can possibly give of what true worship is. It's having a revelation of who our Father is and saying back to him, I love you, Daddy. I love you. I love being around you. I love being in your presence. I love your word. I love your voice. I love your spirit. I love your healing touch. I love your wisdom. I love your, your will. I, I love being with you. And I don't know in a two-year-old brain what's going on, but to me, my best crack at what may be going on and why that may come out unprompted is because over time, these last two and a half years, I provided for her. I've showed up for her. I've been there when she's had a hard moment, been there in her good moments. I've just been there. I've been present. And for me, I play the role of provider for her. I feed her. I take care of her. I take her places. I get her places that she needs to be. I take her to the doctor. And my thought as a pop psychologist would be that what's going on in her brain is she's getting a more clear picture of my role, my, my, who I am to her, and who we are in relationship to one another. And, and I think worship at its purest level, the most basic level, is that. Worship is a response to a revelation. That's what it is. It's a response to our belief and our theology about who God is and, and maybe who he is not. But worship at the core is a response to a revelation, to the presence of Jesus. Uh, and I want to take you to the story. This is, we're going to Luke 7, verse 44, and this will kind of set up where we're going for the rest of the morning. But Luke 7, verse 44, and let me set this age for you. So before we get to verse 44, Jesus is eating at a Pharisee's house named Simon. Now, Pharisees knew a lot about the Lord, a lot about the religious system, a lot about the coming Messiah. They had all the intellectual information down, probably better than you and I do. All the habits, all the things, all the boxes were checked in their life on a regular basis. And Jesus commonly would say, hey, I want to come over and eat with you. And, and so Jesus gets the invite. Simon brings him over. They're having dinner. I don't know how your Thanksgiving was. There's a couple things in our Thanksgiving that just felt like it threw a wrench in an otherwise perfect couple days. You ever have those? Like maybe for you it was a turkey burned or it was that family member who wasn't invited shows up unannounced or the person who was supposed to come text you last minute say, hey, we can't be there or a kid gets sick. Or, I don't know what your thing is, but this is kind of what happens in the story. Simon's rabbi, Jesus, having a great dinner together. All the settings are perfect. Everyone showed up on time. All the food is cooked just according to the recipe. And then this woman shows up. And this woman, the text describes in verse 37, as a woman in that town who lived what they called a sinful life. And that's a very generic, sterile way of saying that she was a sex worker in this community. And she lived a sinful life, and so she barges in. She finds out, hey, John or uh, Jesus is down the road at Simon's house. I've got to go. I've got to be around him. And so she goes in, and she busts open the door, and she sees Jesus eating at Simon's dinner table. And she breaks out this bottle of alabaster, which is an incredibly fragrant, beautiful-smelling perfume found in the, in the ancient Near East, or specifically in the region of Israel. And so it's expensive. It's costly. She brings it, and she actually pours it out on Jesus' feet. The text says that she begins crying, weeping in Jesus' presence. She's wiping off his feet, his dirty, caked feet from the day walking on the sandals, and she washes his feet. Then she wipes it down with her hair, kisses his feet, and continues to pour perfume on him. Now, Simon's like, what are you doing? This is not in the plan. She shows up and announce, and he is dumbfounded at what's happening. And listen to what Jesus says in response to, Di to Simon's perspective. Verse 44, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house, but you didn't give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little 
loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. If I could kind of paraphrase what I think Jesus is trying to teach Simon in this moment, it's that Jesus wants us to rightly respond to his entry, to his presence. He, he wants us to have a good picture of what it means to be a worshiper, what worship means. And what I, strikes me about this story is that the woman, unlikely character, postures herself, postures herself to love Jesus, to worship him fully, which in turn gives her exactly what she truly needs. She didn't maybe probably go in to get forgiveness of sins. It feels like a big ask. But she goes in and she responds in worship and pouring her, her love, her affection, her, her life out on Jesus' feet. It costs her something significant carrying in all the shame of her job, all the shame of family members' accusations and what they said about her. And she brings it all in. She lays it right at Jesus' feet, and he says, you're forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. You're clean. You're whole. And what strikes me about what Jesus says in verse 44 and the ones we read after, after is how strongly he contrasts this woman and Simon. He says it, Simon, you could have gave me that worship. You could have. The invitation was on the table. I'm, I'm the same person, but she is operating at a totally different level of revelation and response. Simon didn't respond to the revelation of who Jesus really is. And that's what worship is. That's very core. Worship is a response to a revelation. And for me, I've looked at my own life, even this season of discerning God's will, trying to figure out what is he doing in our family? What is he calling us into? And what does that mean? Like for me, worship, there's some serious obstacles I've had lately to worship. That's why I felt like this is so important to talk about. Like for me, I'm sitting there and we sing songs, I trust in God, or you're holy, or you provide, or you're the way, the truth, and life. And I'm like, hey, could you give me like a blueprint for the next six months? That's what I really want. I love these songs, but it is difficult for me to trust when I do not know what the future holds. And you may be there. When I don't know if I'm ever going to get pregnant, when I don't know where I should go to college, when I don't know what to do with my life, when I don't know what retirement is supposed to be like or what it's going to feel like, when I don't know what to do with, with this bonus or I don't know what to do with this stretching of my finances I'm in, when I don't know what to do in a season of change or transition or new, whether even if that good is that new is good. When when I don't know, I think that's as we talked about last weekend, that's what a sacrifice of praise really is. That's what it really is. That's what real worship is really like. And so again, go back to the question, like why do I think talking about worship Sunday after kind of announcing just our our next steps and our process and what that means for the church, what that means for our family, why is that significant? And again, I go back to worship as a response to revelation. And I think about just the last couple months, one of like the funnest things about my job, is that a word, funnest? Okay, funner is not, right? Okay, just had a quick grammar moment. So funnest things about my job the last couple weeks uh, and even months has been getting to know Ken. So Ken has stepped in and said yes before how. He said, I'm going to serve as our interim worship and prayer director here at Center. Feels a calling in the ministry again. And and it's been really fun to get to know him and serve along him and Sue these last couple months. But as Ken and I have talked about this, there are so many amazing things out of his own life and story. I was like, I think you need to share some of this stuff. I could say it, but it's going to come different from your life. And uh, so I wanted to, to have him share a little bit. So without further ado, Kevin, Ken Goffman. I almost called you Kevin Goffman. Ken Goffman. They didn't even clap for your first service. Nice. You guys are on it. I love it. So real quick, because I think it would be helpful before we ask any other questions. Like, tell us a little bit as just a community here how you encountered Jesus and maybe even the role that worship played in that whole story. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah first of all, I just want to say thank you also, John, for just uh, allowing me to come on as interim worship director. I, I, that's been a privilege and an honor to do. And I'm Definitely a learning curve for me, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's been really good, and I, I just appreciate that opportunity. And um, But yeah, our, my background, uh, I grew up very new in a very new age home, uh, new age church, and uh, so kind of very liberal interpretations of scripture and everything like that, and I ended up uh, um, believing all kinds of crazy stuff, 
and that didn't line up with scripture, didn't know that. I, I learned a few Bible stories as a kid, um, but I got to a point where um, I was uh, working with a, as a sound man for a rock band, and I ended up meeting this really cute girl at a, uh, at a gig, <laughs> and I uh, started dating her, and we had these incredible conversations about God, because she was the first Christian that I met who actually could articulate her beliefs and, and knew the scripture. And so I'd be throwing out these crazy ideas that I had, like, you know, well, I just believe in reincarnation, and I believe, you know, you're all, you know, all just going to come back several times, you know. And she's like, well, no, the Bible says it's the point that a man wants to die and then the judgment. I'm like, the Bible says that? <laughs> oh, so I, that kind of challenged me, and I started saying, well, you know, I, I thought I believed the Bible, so I thought maybe I'll actually start reading it for, for, to start from. Yeah, so I did that, and I kind of made a commitment. I was starting the book of John. I started reading that, and... Um, few weeks into that, just as I began to read the book of John, just the gospel just became alive to me. Jesus came alive to me. And I was like, this is not who I thought God was at all. And, uh, and I realized that I wasn't really following God. I wasn't, you know, living a, a biblical life at all. And, and it was very, living a very selfish life. And, um, and so I just, at one night, at my bed, I just knelt down and, and said, Lord, I'm just giving you my life. I, I, I want to follow you because I know I, I'll mess it all up. I am messing it all up without you. And that was a, a, a pivotal moment in my life. God just came in and changed me and, and set me free from things. And um, just a, a tremendous time. And very shortly after that, I felt a call into vocational ministry. So we were in the Reformed Church at that time where Sue had grown up. And so we thought, well, I got to go to college and everything else and kind of prepare for that. And in the process, we were also uh, driving to church every Sunday, and we were listening to the radio on the way to church to, uh, to Christian talk radio. Basically, it was basically sermons that we were listening to, and they had all these Pentecostal, charismatic preachers that were, I was listening to. And one of them was Wayne Benson from, um, from First Assembly of God in Grand Rapids. And we're listening to this, and we're going, man, this is really good. This is deep. He's, he's, he's getting to the meat and potatoes of the word. But we're hearing stuff that we're not hearing at our church. <laughs> and, and there's something deeper here that we're not hearing about the spirit of God and, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the moving of the spirit. And we just knew we were missing something. And so we decided, well, let's just go there. We'll attend First Assembly, right? So we show up for an evening service. And our minds were blown. <laughs> we... we uh, this was an unusual service even for First Assembly. We came there. It was a three-hour evening service. No preaching. No message was ever preached. The Spirit of God just took over. It was incredible worship. Really, all the gifts you, you see listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 were all manifest and demonstrated in that service. People were being healed, set free, delivered. Just powerful what God was doing. And, and for me, that was I was so spiritually hungry. I was, and I, and, and I, this was... I was pretty open to anything anyway, so new age, my new age background. And, uh, and so I, we walked out of there, and, and my wife, who grew up very conservative, you know, Dutch, West Michigan, <laughs> she's like, we're never going back there again. <laughs> I said, oh, yes, we are. <laughs> next Sunday. Uh, so the next Sunday, we showed up again, and, uh, and God just began to work in us and open our hearts to, to more of what the Scripture had to say. And we ended up... Um, uh, attending there and getting very involved in, in uh, helping in volunteer ministry. Eventually, I came on staff as a children's pastor. Did that for about 14 years. There, several different roles besides the children's pastor. But, um, but uh, you know, all that was kind of framed around this context of walking into a service where there was such powerful worship that I just could not deny that God was there. He was there in that presence, and I've never felt the presence of God like that. And, and since then, you know, many years in ministry, we've seen, you know, God show up like that in, 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 in many opportunities. We went through it, Grand Rapids First, we had about a four-year revival period of Friday nights where God just moved in power like that, just showed up in, in incredible manifest power and seeing just all kinds of things happening. And, um, and so, you know, but always in that context of worship, when people begin to draw into the worship of God, uh, the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. So when we begin to worship, when we make that, that commitment, say, I'm God, I'm giving you everything right now. I'm, I'm worshiping you. He shows up, and he, he, he wants to show up in power. 
he, he loves to do that. He loves to uh, demonstrate his power and, 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 and touch his, his children, you know, and, and, and with, with his, his freedom and his deliverance, all those, his healing, everything that he has. So, yeah, that's kind of a long story there of how we got there. But <laughs> Awesome. So I think a lot of us, and you kind of alluded to it, all of us come from pretty different backgrounds. Even if you're not growing up in a spiritual religious home, you've got your own story, your own idea of what, what should happen on a Sunday morning, what should that look like. Um, so, Ken, we've talked about this before, too. Like, what do you think most people misunderstand about worship, especially when it comes to being together and doing that? Like, why is it not just enough to worship God on the way to work in my car? Like, why does it matter I show up here and I sing and I lift my hands or whatever? Like, talk to us more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and absolutely, I think both are totally legitimate. Um, I, I drive for my current job. I drive four to uh, two to four hours every day on my current job. So I do a lot of worshiping in my car, <laughs> and I enjoy that very much. But, um, but God wants us to come together as a body as well. So he calls us, um, he says the hand is connected, you know, the eye, the, all, all, all parts of the body, and we all says we need each other. We do need to be in church. We need to come together. And not only because there's something that we supply to one another, but there's something that we supply to God also. When we come together in corporate worship, um, that that there's a, a presence that, that happens in a manifest way that, that wouldn't happen just by ourselves. And um, I think probably one of the biggest misconceptions is this, this idea that um, it's, it's not so the idea that we can get we get distracted so easily. Um, we can walk into a place and we can kind of say, well, this is this is working, this is what you know, I'm kind of watching, just watching people around me. And we forget that we really are coming to church for an audience of one. It really is we're coming for God. We're coming to worship him. It's not, you know, yeah, these are all great relationships. All the things that do happen in a church setting are wonderful. But if we miss the priority, the priority is God. We're coming to meet with God in his presence. And, uh, and I think the second biggest thing is just that um, I've often heard people say this, um, that, you know, people especially are critical of the gospel, critical of God or the Bible, to say, well, you know, I don't believe in God. God must just be egotistical, right? He needs people. Why does he need worship, Right. And it would sound that way, but the, the, it's, a, it's a total misconception because God, God doesn't need our worship. It's not, it's not worship he's looking for. It's worshipers. He's looking for those who will draw near to him, that want to have a commune with him, have a relationship with him. That's what he's looking for. And so when we come to church, I think we also have to be aware that sometimes we can come and just say, well, I'm just offering up my worship. I'm just singing my song like I usually do and, you know, and sit and listen to the sermon. And, and we forget that, that God is wanting to meet with us right here when we come together. And his presence is here for that. And so as we come as a corporate body, that we come prepared for that and, and be careful about not letting ourselves get distracted sometimes by what's going on around us. Yeah, that's good. Well, it's kind of interesting. You read through the Bible, even this unique story in Luke 7. Uh, what doesn't happen in Luke 7 is Jesus says, hey, you need to cry at my feet and wipe your snot on my feet, and you need to wipe it down with my hair, and then you need to bring alabasters, not like this prescription for how they should worship, and Simon somehow missed that. What I think the, the woman in Luke 7 catches that most of us miss, just building on what Ken said, is it is a response. And sometimes that response does look different. And sometimes it is a little uncomfortable. Sometimes it is uh, outside of the tradition even we grew up in. And so talk to us a little bit, Ken, because I know you and I have talked about this. Like, what role does singing, raising our hands, like engaging our body, what role should that play in worship and doing that together? Well, as you look at Scripture, it, it's easy to kind of come on Sunday and say, well, my posture of worship is I sing. My posture worship is maybe I lift my hands a little, you know. <laughs> or maybe I'll go the whole way, you know. I lift them all the way up. But that time we think that's that's kind of the only postures that there are for worship. There are so many postures described in the Bible. Just a couple of them, just just name a few: singing, playing instruments, raising our hands, shouting, dancing, waving banners, giving is a is a form of worship, kneeling, falling prostrate with our face to the ground, crying, laughter, silence listening, contemplating, these are all postures of worship. And I think a lot of times we, we become overly familiar, we get comfortable with, with one form. You know, I'm saying, well, what I do is I sing. <laughs> or some people say, I don't have a good voice.
boy, so I don't even sing, you know. Um, I make a joyful noise. That's good, too. You know, so the thing is, is just being careful that we don't get so comfortable with one form that we fall into what I, I believe is, I'm guilty of this, is falling into a spiritual rut where I just show up on Sunday and I do the same thing because it's what I always do. And instead of saying, God, am I, am I really coming with an idea that I'm offering you everything I've got, you know, including my emotions, including, you know, you, you want it all. And, uh, and just being willing to give that to him um, in, in sometimes unfamiliar ways. And you, you mentioned uh, the other week here about uh, a David, you know, who danced before the Lord and his own wife was just indignant at him. You know, like, how could you dance before the Lord like that? Make a spectacle of yourself. And she was judging his, her, his heart. And I think sometimes we can also do this in a worship setting is we can see somebody else who maybe is responding in a different way than we're used to responding. And we begin to say, well, why are they doing that in church? You know, I'm trying to, you know, draw attention to himself or something like that. And, and we, that, that, that is a clear indicator of a religious spirit right there when we're judging other people and how they worship. Um, because uh, it, you see it over and over. There's a whole other story in the Bible of, of, the out, of, of a, a woman pouring out oil, the Mary of Bethany. She pours out, in the other three Gospels, she pours out oil on him as well. And immediately, immediately, they all start getting on her case. Oh, man, she spent that expense. That's a, that's a year's worth of salary there. She, she just threw away at Jesus' feet. You know, she could have given that to the poor. All these critical spirit coming at her. And Jesus said, would you just stop? What she did is a good thing. In fact, she actually prepared. She, this is a, free, a couple days before he's going to be crucified. She's actually preparing for me for my burial. So they read the total wrong motives into what they were seeing in her. Jesus saw that her true heart. And I think we just always have to lead that to God and say, God, I, you know, help me not have a critical spirit. Help me to be open, including be open to worshiping you in different ways that I maybe am not comfortable with. Yeah, I think that's what really strikes me about this story in Luke 7, because the woman brings Jesus' offering of herself, of this alabaster jar, but again, her focus is not, what am I getting out of this whole thing? Her focus is, what can I bring? How can I bring something that's going to honor King Jesus? How can I bring something that is going to show him value? And it's a response to that presence, a response to the revelation, ultimately, of all of that. Um, and I think one of the things that really struck me, this is probably a couple of years ago, I had the kind of this image of like approaching corporate worship, hoping for to receive something from God is like a guest entering your home and putting their hands out for a gift from you. If you think about that, let me say that one more time. Like approaching worship, hoping to receive something from God is like a guest entering your house and putting out their hands for a gift. Like, in so many ways, I think you get what you need when your focus is not on you. And when your focus is, is fully on Jesus and his presence and who he is. And when I come to bring in, this is, this is David in Psalm 132, right? What does he do with that whole vow to build a resting place for the Lord? He employs musicians and worshipers and prayer leaders and, and priests to come before the Lord, not to serve the people of Israel, but to bring a sacrifice of praise and, and day and night prayer and worship to the Lord. And when they do that, when the focus is singular, just like Ken talked about, you get your need met. At the end of this story, Jesus turns and says, hey, by the way, your sins are forgiven. And, and I don't know if it was in her heart to even ask for that, but she comes and she brings an offering. She, she gets what she needs at the end of the story. Uh, and I, to be honest, some of the most profound moments in my life have come from worshiping God and not focusing on my needs or what I have, what I, or the answers I'm looking for. And I remember it was a couple of years ago, I was at this conference, and, and I just kind of knew, I was like, okay, I'm probably going to cry every single session of this conference. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in scenarios like that. And I'm not a crier. Like, it's probably very rare if you've been here for the last six, seven years that you see me just, like, openly weep. But, but that was because a couple of years ago before this conference, because it was such a landmark moment for me before this conference, I remember sitting as a counselor, and one of the areas that we talked about, he, I was like, I'm just... I feel like emotionally stopped up. And, and maybe if you're a guy, you can resonate. It's like I've got emotions, but they don't get out. Like they don't come out. I, I struggle to cry. I struggle to feel like any highs or lows. I just kind of feel like mid-level all the time. Like what, what is wrong with me? And he's like, well, what do you believe is true about emotions? Are they from God? Are they helpful? 
Are they going to bless your relationships? Is it are you a better leader if you're emotionally in tune than when you're emotionally suppressed or just cut off? And so I, his assignment for the week was like, I want you to go. I want you to journal what you believe about emotions. I want you to come back. What if what he called an emotional manifesto? And so I did that. I was like, I don't even know where to start, man. Just, okay, I'm just going to start writing. I had to read it to him. And it turns out God wanted to use my emotions. He wanted to free me up. He wanted to be me be able to cry in his presence. Like he wanted me to be able to be open and honest and transparent with my wife and with my girls. And, and again, the, the sermon, the teaching is not about emotions. But my point is when I had a clear revelation of that, my responses changed. And the same is true in worship. When you have a clear picture, is Jesus worthy? Is he real? Is he in this room right now like you just sang about? Is he truly a king over all the earth? Does he have dominion and sovereignty and authority? Does he speak things into existence? If all those things are true, then my response will change. If they're not true, then coming in and just standing here, just watching everyone else do it is, is good enough, I guess. No, it's, that, that's all we're doing. And, and it started to shift even my posture towards worship because I began to realize even on Sunday morning, my job is not to humor the worship leader. Like he needs me to cheer him on. Good job singing, Ken. Keep going. You're like, you can do it, buddy, and I'm going to sing with you. Like, just like Ken said, that is an almost more appropriate way to orient this room would be Jesus' presence at the back and all of us facing him. Yeah. You know, so that that's really what we're after. Sure, it's good to have someone help us figure out where to sing when, but, but that is not the goal. It's just to watch someone else do it. We are all equipped with a voice and a body and a life to, to bring what Romans call a sacrifice, a living sacrifice of worship. To God, and so I'll give you the last word, and I'd love to close this out in prayer before we. Before we yeah, I, do, I just want to say that you know, to remember that each of us has something that we're bringing on on Sunday when we come here together. That we are we are bringing something that only we can bring, and when we all are bringing that together, it invites the presence of God in a way that will never happen just by ourselves. And so I just encourage you as we come in Sunday morning, say, God, I. I just want to bring you everything. I'm just re recommitting my life to you, re rededicating my worship to you, and just come with that hard attitude. Say, and, and if that means expressing it in an unusual way or in a way I'm not, fam you know, I'm I may not comfortable with, I'm willing to offer it to you. I, I I imagine it was a little uncomfortable for that woman to just pour it out there and know that everybody's looking at her, thinking she's a spectacle and judging her, but her heart was in the right place. So I just encourage you to 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 come with that attitude. It's really good. Well, we're going to close. I'm going to invite Lynn to come up. We're going to sing and just reflect on, on one, one last song. But I want to ask you really two questions. Uh, and these are the questions I've wrestled with uh, over these last couple months. Um, and even as fresh as this week when I knew we were going to talk about this. The first question is this. Where do you need fresh revelation? Because if you feel like your responses are stale or you're in that spiritual rut <laughs> today, or we sing and it just does nothing for you. You just have zero interest in singing, zero interest in engaging or raising your hands or any of that. It may be time for a revelation check. It may be time to look at the, the revelation dashboard of your own life and just say, you know what, where am I at with this? And, and let me just tell you, that that's, that's exactly the season I'm in right now. I'm saying, God, I need you to reveal yourself that you will take care of me. That you called me to step out in faith into what is a very much unknown season. And you're going to take care of my family, my career, my next steps, my calling, my, my financial needs that I have. You're going to take care of me. And I'm asking. Even as we sang, I was back to, I was just like, God, will you show me that? I need you to freshly reveal that to me. Because I'm struggling right now to feel like that. And so maybe you need a fresh revelation. Secondly, maybe you've got all the revelation. You're like, yeah, I, re I relate to Simon. And I just need to have the courage and boldness to, to respond. So what do you need to respond to? What revelation have you received that you need to respond to? And not just sit and be a warm body in the aisle, but to allow God to do something in these times where we lift up our voice, lift up our, our praise and our worship to the Lord. So I'd love to pray for us before we finish out and as we sing that. But I want you to, to ponder those as we sing. So Jesus, we just come before you. Just like we said, you deserve it all, all of it. Our life, our, our song, our bodies, our 
mind, our emotions, our finances, our kids, our parenting decisions, our retirement, our legacy, our name, our our workplace, our marriages, our singleness. God, you deserve it all. And I pray that even now we would just look back and there just would be a line in the sand for many of us today to say, you know what? I'm not content to just play church. I'm not content to live just in a religious cycle. I I want a fresh encounter. I want new revelation. I want to pour out my alabaster jar at the feet of Jesus every single time I get the chance. So, Lord, pray. I just pray you make us open. Make us available. Make us a, a people of a single mind, a single focus. And you can have it all can have it all. In my own life, God, I just confess how many times I come into a space like this and I look around, I'm so easily distracted and I miss the one thing that's the better thing. It's to be with you, to exalt you, to value your presence, to respond rightly when you enter the room. So we love you. Pray you teach us in all of this, Holy Spirit. It's in your name.